passing the pressure or vacuum into a system of electromechanical valves, which in turn control uh, 51 brown paper bags that inflate and deflate between 8 and 12,000 times a day, which is the normal respiratory frequency for an adult at rest. So we're trying for the brown paper bags to give that sense of materiality of the, of the breathing. And um, there are no filters, so you are basically exposed to viruses, bacteria, pheromones, all kinds of airborne pollutants. There's a danger of panic because to get out, you need to go through the decompression chamber again. And there's also a danger of asphyxiation because it has about 10 days of oxygen. We ask people to be there 10 days only, I mean 10 minutes only. Um, and there's big warnings, right, that say, you know, do not enter, but people still do it. And this project is um, pretentiously, I, I think of this project as something about the commons, right? Uh, did you guys hear the CEO of Nestle say that water is not a fundamental human right? He's owner of San Pellegrino and Evian and all the bottling of water, right? So, of course he would say that, but it's really interesting to think about the commons, right? Well, who owns the water and the air and the land, right? So, in this project, we create like a little petri dish of experimentation where you can smell the impact that your own presence has on the environment. So it's, like I said, it's pretty gross. I, I actually did go one time. Um, the, the, there's one more point about that. What did I want to tell you about this? Um, so it's gross. Well, anyway, on the subject of participation, myself and other artists that work with participation, we always speak about participation as something very positive. You know, it's like, ah, oh, you know, you'll have agency and the public, we'll have the scale of the urban space and so on and so forth. In this piece, it's a little different. If you participate too much, you die. So it's a perversion of the concept of participation. <coughs> so more projects. This one's uh, hundreds of thousands of numbers extracted from Google Street View, and they're presented at random. And then when you walk in, the tracking system detects you and puts your silhouette. And inside of your silhouette, all the numbers count down to 1984. So, and then if you walk away, they go back to random. Um, another of the pulse pieces, this was a recent one in uh, Abu Dhabi. So in this one, um, it's uh, controlling searchlights. And um, each, each shape that is created is not just the heart rate, but it's also, uh, like I said, all of the different um, variables that we get from the sensors make a different light formation for each person that tries it. Uh, could you bring the sound up just so we can hear that? And it also had a sound component. <laughs> Um, um, as you may know, three years ago, the Mexican government uh, kidnapped 43 students from Iguala in Guerrero, Ayotzinapa. And this is a project, it's not really an artwork, it's more like an activist strategy. It's a camera <coughs> that is always <coughs> looking for the students. So when you stand in front of it, it analyzes your facial features using police and military technology. And it compares you to the database of the 43 students that have not been found as of yet. And the system tries to see if you're one of them or who you look like the most. And so it says, okay, based on your facial features, you look most like Martin Getsemani Garcia. But then it gives you a level of confidence. The tracking system says, we are confident 17%. In other words, the result is student not found. And the idea with this project is that it's completely free. Anybody can download it from our webpage. You supply a, a webcam, a display, and a computer, and you can set it up. So the project has been set up so far in 45 museums and universities and foundations around the world. And of course, the project is not going to find the students because likely they were massacred. Um, according to the official story, the Mexican police gave the kids to the Guerreros Unidos drug cartel and they disappeared them, but there's no forensic evidence that that happened, so the family members are still looking for them. But this project is in, in, in instead you know, about the creationship of more fraternal links, you know, the idea that these are not just some kids that happened, but that this is us, that you can be next that this relationship of likeness is not others, but is you yourself. 
So it's on the one hand that, on the other hand is to keep the search alive, so this project will keep on searching for them forever. And then on the other hand is to generate income, because every time we show this piece, or if we sell it or whatever, the entire, um, the entire proceeds go to the affected community. So these kids that were 17 to 21 year olds, um, you know, some left some orphans, uh, there's other students and so on, so we're supporting the community through the project itself. We've generated so far $70,000. Um, and, um, and there's one more element about this project. Um, when I did this project in Canada, so I'm based in Montreal, right? And um, the CBC came and said, oh, you know, the situation in Mexico is very dire. And I said, yes, it's very dire. But now we're working with the same software with Aboriginal programmers to make a version of this project that doesn't look for the 43 Ayotzinapa students, but to look for the over 1,000 Aboriginal women that have been missing and disappeared in Canada in the past five, 10 years. So the idea, the idea of this project is that the source code is open, that anybody can reuse it for their own search. Um, and as such, is. Um, that's why I'm saying it's not really like an artwork that I show in a museum. It's more like a strategy. And I've been criticized because some people think that I'm profiting from the tragedy. Um, and it's a, if we want, we can debate that later. But I just feel that the artist is a citizen. And as a citizen, you have to do something. And we have, you know, face tracking mechanisms. So this is what we did with it. We're almost done, you guys. Um, this is a uh, water fountain. And which writes poetry with water, with water vapor in midair. So, for the first version of it, we're using the poetry of Octavio Paz, a Mexican poet, who spoke about the moment where poetry is recited and it becomes the atmosphere, and then we can breathe it in. Um, and um, here's how it works you look down at it, and then it starts writing the texts. And then the text disappear, and it's, it's very slow. So at my studio, we're working a lot with water now because we think um, water is the light of day. We are animating water in ways that we think is critical or poetic. We think that um, fountain technology is very powerful, and not many people are doing substantially interesting stuff with it. So anyway, that kind of deal. Um, I do commissions, so for example, this is a building that is on Ejército Nacional and Periférico in Mexico City, and the proposal is to create a, a media facade, like we're seeing everywhere. I go around the world criticizing the way that we're illuminating our buildings. I really detest color-changing lights. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no reason for a building to be cyan and then magenta and then emerald green. There's no reason, and this is sadly happening across the world. They call it architainment, and I really have a flag against this, right, because it's homogenizing our city. So if you've ever been to Istanbul, Istanbul had a beautiful lighting scheme, and uh, Phillips just put $10 million worth of color-changing lights in one of the Bosphorus bridges, and it just changes, and it looks like, you know, like Las Vegas. I, I like it in Las Vegas, but don't bring that to Istanbul, right? And the sad thing is that people like it, so people want these color-changing lights. I think there's a big responsibility for lighting designers. If you're going to use light and pollute the night, you need to use it for a reason. You need to create something that's going to be memorable or it's going to be a contribution. In the particular example here in this building, uh, it's in a very polluted area. And um, so what I defend is eccentricity. I defend the capability for artists to make something that is uh, a bad idea. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put LEDs on all the mullions and all the columns uh, between the lights, uh, between the windows. And at night, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, bless his heart, the developer accepted. Um, it's basically like an iris scanner. You go and look at it at the building, and then your eye becomes part of the facade. But I'm telling you, it's very, very unlikely you will forget this building. You know, it's like, well, where? where, where you know, where is the building? Oh, you won't miss it. It's like full of eyes. That's what I think will happen. Last project to show you. Um, so, um, in the 19th century, a guy called Charles Babbage, the inventor of the first computer, he's a British um, inventor, said that when we speak, 
we create a turbulence, all right? And then that this turbulence is in the atmosphere. And he said in 1836 that if we had a sufficiently com um, sophisticated computer, we could track the movement of the molecules and rewind them in such a way that we could recreate the voices of everybody who's spoken in the past. So for Charles Babbage, the atmosphere was an immense library with every memory of everything that has ever been said. So I just love this idea, this kind of ghost-like presence of everything that has been said. And so at the studio, working with uh, Auburn University, NYU, and Georgia Tech, we developed a system to actually record the movement of air as it comes from your mouth. So we use a laser tomography uh, machine um, to scan your voice as it comes out. And with photogrammetry, we create a three-dimensional model, which then we print in steel. So this is the very first 3D printed speech bubble. Um, it's the size of your hand, and um, it's made out of steel. Sometimes I lie, and I say that the first thing we printed is the word fuck, because I really like the idea that you can just throw it at somebody. <laughs> but, um, but it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's the French word oh, because it's 